Welcome back to County Line Sports. I'm your host, Bill Downing. And on the phone, Brandon Caldwell from Talking in Circles podcast. And, well, it, the season's come to an end, Brandon. And uh, this may not be the last time. I'm hoping it's not the last time we talk because you know how silly season is during the off season. But, hey, uh, welcome back to the show. Hey, God, thanks for having me, Bill. Uh, you know, it's um, bittersweet. Uh, you know, the season is long and dragging at times, so it's uh, – Nice for it to end, but also we don't get to see some racing in uh, you know, 90 days until the day 2500. I can't wait. <laughs> I know. I saw you. I saw you post that, and I'm just thinking, wow, it's like those people right after Labor Day. So many days till Christmas. And no, you're right. Speed weeks. As soon as I start seeing that stuff on Fox Sports and getting ramped up, it's time to uh, get back to it. And uh, so many things, so many storing lines uh, heading into Homestead. One, you know, Jeff Gordon, his final run uh, with a chance for the drive for five. Kyle Bush in an area where he's not used to being. Uh, Kevin Harvick, you know, could he repeat? We don't know. Martin Truex Jr., kind of the sleeper in all this. Uh, but boy, I tell you, so many storylines. Where do we even start? Well, I think we've got to start with Kyle Bush. And, you know, there's a lot of people today. Obviously, he won the NASCAR Spring Cup Series championship. Congratulations to him. But there's a lot of people who are looking at this as skeptical. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I hear skeptical. You. <laughs> um, because he missed the first 11 races of the 2016, uh, 2015 season. Mm-hmm. And for I can't blame them for some of it because I understand that they want a champion to run all of the races. And I do get that aspect of it. Um, but I also look at it and I say, well, you know, you could have knocked Kyle Busch out the previous nine races. There were 16 drivers in this chase. 15 of them could have knocked Kyle out in the previous nine races and he was able to get through. Right. Um, whether or not he should have been or shouldn't have been granted a waiver is probably a different topic. Uh, but he is the NASCAR Spring Cup champion. This is the format that we run to, and I have never really been on board with this format since they announced it. I was lambasted for it. I was called a hater. I was called somebody who was negative. I must not love the sport because I'm so negative. And now it's coming to fruition only two years in. I agree. You know, the, the system... I don't know. I kind of like the old school system. You know, it, it wouldn't have mattered. Maybe by Martinsville, you know, if, if the chase wasn't there uh, back in the day, somebody have already known, you know, that this guy's going to win the championship because he's so far ahead. Uh, they've tweaked this system. They make so many changes that the normal NASCAR fan is just shaking their head going, you know, first of all, I can't afford the ticket. Second of all, I don't understand what's going on. And it seems like rules are made to be broken and then the rules that are broken we don't know what the rules are we don't know what the gray area is just so many unanswered questions for the regular everyday nascar fan oh yeah and yesterday i was talking to a fan uh, to, to a person at my job who is work works in a different uh, sporting field now but was a race fan growing up and i was trying to explain to him the current format and he, you know when he heard he was watching the, i had the race on he happened to be watching it and when he heard there were four drivers running for the championship, he said, man, it must be pretty close. And I said, no, 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 they did that intentionally. And I explained to him the format that there's eliminations. Mm-hmm. And, all, and he says, that's so confusing. The old way was so much easier. And that, that there's no way that that would reward a true champion of the sport. And I completely agree with them. And I, so that, was been, that has been my, um, my negativeness towards this chase mm-hmm. from the beginning was that you wouldn't get a legitimate champion. Now, it is what it is. Kyle Busch is the 2015 NASCAR Spring Cup Series champion. Mm-hmm. The ratings for yesterday's race were 51% higher, 51% higher this year than they were last year. So you know Brian France and all of his people mm-hmm. up in NASCAR are going to absolutely love that. NBC is going <laughs> to love that as right, well. Right. But I almost look at it like when a writer writes an article that it may not be legitimate, but still gets reads. That's almost the way I look at it. When you you know those articles, you see them posted mm-hmm. on Twitter. You go, man, this is BS. But the people, the sheep, will believe it. They'll click on it, and that's all that matters to the company that the guy is writing for is how many clicks it gets, right. and not necessarily the trueness of the article. I, I agree with you. You know, uh, when you look at the old system, uh, there wasn't four people. It, it could have been, you know, six people, you know, within 20 points of each other that had a chance for it or eight or whatever it was. Or we already knew who the champion was. Everybody was fighting for second on back. You know, now, like you said, you know, it, it, we talked about it last week. Uh, the fact is you don't have to win to be there at the end, it seems like. And then, you know, you had Truex Jr., no wins. Uh, you had Bush. 
Bush that uh, missed the first 11 races. Then you had Kevin Harvick, the guy that's consummately right where he should be. You know, he's always fighting for a win in every race. And then you had Jeff Gordon, the guy that didn't win until he, you know, the, the Logano Kenza deal at and uh, Martinsville, uh, he gets the big win and moves on to the championship four. And uh, it, it, you're right. I think the old system was much better. This one, very, very confusing. Like you said, you know, Carl Edwards, I had no idea. He was only five points out of making it to the final four. It's just, you know, you just don't know this stuff compared to the old school way. Oh, absolutely. And, and, we knew going into this race what it was going to be, and we and I told you last week. You know, Kevin Harvick was obviously the favorite, mm-hmm. and Kyle Busch was number two, or Gordon was two, and Bush was three. Mm-hmm. And I said you could kind of reverse each one of those two because they were so close. And then there was the seventy-eight, and the reason why I said that was because I thought that the seventy-eight car with Martin Truex Jr. even at their best couldn't beat Kyle Busch, Kevin Harvick, and Jeff Gordon at their mm-hmm. best. Mm-hmm. And it mattered that yesterday the eighteen car of Kyle Busch was at his best, and he wasn't at his best very much this year, but when he was, he was dominant. Even Mm -hmm. Jeff Gordon, when he was at his best this year, wasn't at a dominant. I think a lot of people who picked Gordon were picking with their hearts and not their heads. Anybody who was surprised by that run yesterday, Mm -hmm. I think, was thinking with their hearts. When you really, if you look at the year he had, this shouldn't be very surprising that he didn't go out there and win at Homestead yesterday. And then Kevin Harvick, who wasn't as dominant this year, wasn't as, um, you know, consistently running up front for wins this year as he was last season. Mm-hmm. And it cost him a homestead by speed like a late race caution, which is still skeptical in my opinion. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> nearly changed the course of the race. But uh, that's, a, you know, the good thing was the championship hunt didn't change because of that caution. Right, and I remember, I, I believe, I, uh, I I may have messaged you and said, are you kidding me? Can you believe it? You know, with nine laps left, it's just like, there's a conspiracy out there somewhere saying, yeah, we got to bunch them up. You know, this is this is what it's all about. You know, this guy's running away with, with the race. But, uh, you know, NASCAR is NASCAR. They're going to do what they're going to do. And uh, a lot of people shaking their heads. And uh, we talked about it last week. You know, all three series coming to an end at Homestead Miami Speedway. Uh, Eric Jones, no uh, no surprise that he wins the Camping World Truck Series. Chris Buescher uh, does what he has to do uh, to win the Xfinity Series. And like you said, Kyle Busch. Uh, gets his first Sprint Cup Series championship. He joins his brother as uh, one of the very few brother combos. Besides, I believe the Labonis were maybe the other one. I, I may be wrong. There may be others, but uh, those no, are the two it. recents. Those are the two. Those are the two brothers, the Bushes and Labonis, and you know they joined a great format. We all knew they joined some great names. We all knew Kyle was, was going to win a championship. Uh, we know he's a very talented guy. When he five years ago, he was a different guy. He overdrove the equipment. He was a hothead. And I don't think that that Kyle Busch would have won a championship uh, this year. He didn't do any of that, but I didn't think he was as good this year as he's been in years past. Right. But sometimes it's just the way the cards fall, and he was able to sneak away at the championship here. Chris Busher did what he had to do. He'll be back in the Xfinity Series for Jack Roush next year. But that's a big important win there for Roush Fenway Racing, I think, because of how much they have struggled in the past, especially at the Spring Cup level, mm-hmm. to get something in the Xfinity level that they can sell to a sponsor and have a good young driver in Chris Buescher, I think is a positive for that, for that Rash Fenway team. And then, of course, Eric Jones becomes the first NASCAR driver ever to win a rookie of the year and a championship in the same season in mm-hmm. any division. And he goes out and does that uh, yesterday, or Friday night right. at Homestead Money Speedway in the Camping World Truck Series. Well, I can tell you that... Uh, uh, he definitely was one of those dominant racers, uh, the young guns, as they call it. I know that uh, uh, Chase Elliott uh, ended up being really close to uh, Chris Buescher in points in the Xfinity Series. You know, he jumps over to the 24. Kyle Busch does what he has to do. Uh, so many storylines going into Homestead, and I think there's a lot of storylines coming out of Homestead. Uh, when you talk about uh, Michael Waltrip Racing, their their career, their teams, everything that you know Michael Waltrip Racing has done, Clint Boyer moved. On, I know that uh, David Reagan is no longer going to be in the car. Michael Waltrip Racing is no more. Yeah, it's, that's a shame because this was. And what's interesting about this whole thing is Toyota came to bat here with three big race teams in 2007 when they jumped the board. If you remember, Joe Gibbs Racing didn't join until 2008, the year after Toyota joined it. They were still in a contract with General Motors for 2007, and they joined with Michael Waltrip Racing and three race teams there. They joined with uh, Red Bull Racing with two teams there, and then Bill Davis Racing as well. Mm-hmm. All three of those teams now are out of here. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a sad day, I think, for motorsports. 
Michael built something. They really struggled early on. Rob Kaufman came in and saved the day. But the thing we're going to look back on when we talk about Michael Waltrip racing and what began the downward spiral for this team was the spin gate at Richmond a few years ago. Um, you know, there's no need to go into detail, but that was really the beginning of the end. Napa left uh, after that race, and that really set that team into a two-car team. And then when they became a two-car team, they still tried to survive. This year, Aaron's announced that they weren't going to come back for a full season uh, for 2016 if they were going to come back at all. And that's when Rob Coffin said, you know what, I need to get out of from underneath this because I'm mm-hmm. dumping my own money into this race team and it's not going to be profitable. If I don't have a sponsor, couldn't find a sponsor to replace it. And now it's bought into Chip Ganassi Racing. Right. And whatever assets can be sold of Michael Walter Racing is going to be sold. And it's a sad day. A lot of people are losing their jobs over this. You're starting to see some uh, team members get picked up by other teams today. Billy Scott, uh, who was the crew chief for Clint Boyer at the end of the season, started with the 55 and then went to Clint Boyer in the 15. Um, he has now joined Danica Patrick's team, and he's going to replace Daniel Canosa on top of the pit box there for Danica Patrick mm-hmm. in 2016. Three crew chiefs in three years for her. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I, 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 and this is just a personal opinion I have. I think Danica, you know, she's, you got to be a good driver to do any of these kind of racing whatsoever. She's open wheel. She knows how to drive NASCAR. Um, the good for the sport, how long does that really go when you know you're in a sport where longevity is something that can happen, but you have to have success during that, not only through commercials and selling of items in trailers and so forth. You know, how much longer do you think uh, she can be, um, at least with Stuart Haas, and not go down to some of these smaller type teams uh, because of the lack of success that she's had with, uh, it, it, with Stuart Haas Racing? It depends how long sponsors want to dump money into her. Mm-hmm. Listen, GoDaddy.com was a big sponsor for her. Came in, threw a lot of money at this, and there's no question in my eyes. If they were running for championships and, and making chases year in and year out, I think they'd still be here. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are backing out of Annika Patrick. Coming in next year as a sponsor that the demographic doesn't seem to fit NASCAR, Nature's Bakery. It's almost a little bit scary to look at that sponsorship mm-hmm. and say, man, that's what we have to sell for Danica Patrick, who's a big name in this sport. But eventually... Being here isn't going to be good enough, and there's a lot of reasons to blame for this. I'm not so sure she's the most talented driver in the Spring Cup Series garage area, Mm -hmm. but she also went to the NASCAR Xfinity Series and only went to one season. We've seen a lot of these open-wheel drivers come over here and and struggle mightily. Uh, Number one on that list is Sam Hornish Jr. Mm -hmm. He doesn't look like he has arrived next year. Dario Franchi, Jack Villeneuve, Patrick Carpentier, Christian Fittipaldi. Juan Pablo Montoya made it, but never became, never really competed for championships, but did a decent job here. Right. Uh, the only two drivers to ever really have some success in Sprint Cup coming open from open wheel and IndyCar for a full-time basis are John Andretti and Tony Stewart. Right. And those two, you know, Tony Stewart obviously has had years of success, um, but to me, Danica needed more time in stock cars. She went one full Xfinity Series season, mm-hmm. finished 10th in points, her teammate, Cole Witt, finished eighth in points that year and lost his ride. And she was promoted to the Sprint Cup Series at Stuart Haas Racing. Now, I know there's a lot that goes into that. I'm sure GoDaddy was, wanted to go Sprint Cup Racing as soon as possible. Right. But I think in the long term for Danica, it would have benefited her greatly to get at least another year or two in the Xfinity Series to understand the, sprint, uh, to understand the stock cars. Because I think right now she's so far behind the eight ball that everybody's gaining and she's was still just learning, and now she's finally starting to catch up. But she's on her third crew chief now in three years, and I mm-hmm. thought her and Daniel Knost had something going on this year. I thought she ran a little bit better this year. And I don't get the move all of a sudden now to bring in Billy Scott. I know Rodney Childers, who is the crew chief for Kevin Harmick, was at Michael Walter Racing, and Billy Scott worked under him as an engineer. Mm-hmm. And he, I'm sure, get, came and said Billy Scott's got rave reviews, but Chad Johnston did too. When he was at Michael Walter Racing, that's part of the reason why Chad Johnston got the job at, at the 14 car with Tony Stewart, and he's out of the job now. So you never know how a crew chief is going to relate to a driver. And Canost seemed to be able to relate to Danica pretty well, mm-hmm. and they seemed to have a pretty nice year. I wouldn't have made the change, but Stewart Haas Racing did.
I I couldn't agree with you more. That is very very well said, and uh, uh, it's just I I don't know how much longer it's going to last. It's not my call, but like you said, uh, money talks, and uh, if they want her to keep driving and being a sponsor, I never understood the whole nature's best a bakery. I just never understood that when it was announced, and then I saw the paint scheme. I'm like, it just doesn't work compared to what she had with GoDaddy. But hey, you know, I, I don't make the calls. Uh, that, that must be something that Stuart Haas thinks that. It's gonna that's gonna work for them, and uh, we wish them the best of luck. One of the things that I noticed that uh, are in trouble is is Jack Roush Racing. You know, when you look at their stable uh, compared to what they were, I would think even five, maybe six to seven years ago, every track they went to, Roush Racing, the Fords, they were uh, just always up there. You had Biffle, you had Kenseth, you had Bush, you had Martin. You've got now you've got. Biffle, who's struggling, who uh, their their big sponsor, I believe, Ortho, is not coming back. Uh, Ricky yep. Stenhouse Jr., the only thing he's really got going is he's dating Danica, and uh, that, his racing career has not been very spectacular in the Sprint Cup series. And uh, Jack Roush, you know, for someone that, you know, they call him Jack, you know, uh, Jack in the Hat uh, and the other nicknames he has, uh, it, it's tough to see this guy struggling. I don't know. How do you think he's going to have to fix this problem? I don't know. I think the worst thing that this team's been doing, there's been some speculation about this, but Steve Letarte made this point earlier in the year, and I agree with him 100%. I think the worst team, the worst thing Jack Rash and Rash Family Racing could do right now is get rid of Greg Biffle. I know he's 45 years old. Mm-hmm. He's going to be 46 by the time January rolls around, and that's old, but he was here a rookie in 2003. He doesn't have that many miles on him, and I still think Greg Biffle can win a championship. Mm-hmm. I think he's a world of, got a world of talent out there. And there's no question in my mind he's the best driver right now at the Rash Fenway Racing Stable. Mm-hmm. Um, and you do want a driver at your team that's struggling, that's had some success. And Biffle's had a lot of success. And you want somebody who knows, okay, this is what we need to be fast, and this is what we don't need. Where the other two drivers are younger. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and Trevor Bain are very young drivers. Right. They've never had success at the Spring Cup level. Um, I think Jack could turn it around. There are, you know, this Michael Waltrip racing move is interesting because he did have a lot of good engineers there. And, you know, Roush is trying to pluck some of them and bring them to his race team. Um, Trevor Bain was a tremendous young driver when he first signed on with Junior Motorsports. And then, or, I'm sorry, with DEI. And then he moved over to Michael Waltrip racing. Michael couldn't guarantee him a Sprint Cup ride. He went to Jack Roush, won the Daytona 500 driving for the Wood Brothers, and had some sort of diagnosis. And ever since that diagnosis, Trevor Bain has just has not been the same driver. His performance has tapered off significantly. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. has shown, shown some signs of success, but then he's shown, shown some signs of, where, where is this guy? I think he's got some talent as a race car driver. I think he needs to focus a little bit more on being in the race car and driving race cars and not necessarily being a celebrity. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. And... He had a great crew chief a couple of years ago who was currently out the crew chief for Chris Buescher in the Xfinity Series, Scott mm-hmm. Graves. Mm-hmm. And those two had some success. They really looked pretty good. It was Stenhouse's sophomore season, and I thought that they did pretty well that year. And for some reason, Jack Roush made the move to bring in Mike Kelly, who was an Xfinity Series crew chief, before last season. And that was really where this downward spiral for Stenhouse took a major hit. Mm-hmm. He obviously lost Carl Edwards, which was a big driver with big sponsor dollars coming to him. Um, and he has AdvoCare, which seems to be pretty committed to, to Trevor Bain and seems to be pretty happy with Trevor Bain. But, yeah, things are not right right now at Rash Fenway Racing. And if they can't sell the sponsor for Greg Biffle, it's going to be very difficult for them to compete. And I think you may see Biffle moved out of there and Ryan Reed, who's an Xfinity Series driver, has plenty of backing, uh, come up and maybe take that ride for next season just out of Jack Roush. will have no other options at that point and have to make that move, even though I think – the worst thing they could do is get rid of Greg Biffle. Yeah, you're right. You got to have some kind of senior leadership whatsoever there, and I think uh, he he is the key to uh, mentoring. And like you said, I, I think he is capable of winning. I mean, he was able to win it back in the Camping World Truck Series. So with Granger, he did it in the Xfinity Series back. I think it was Bush or Nationwide back then uh, with Granger also. So this guy has talent. It's just. Uh, 
I, I've never seen a, a team such as like Jack Roush struggle as much, you know, and go through so many big name drivers. I mean, we're talking some big names have come through that stable, um, you know, compared to like Hendrick, where you know these guys pretty much they sign a lifetime contract and they're there uh, forever. And and it's tough to see because I, I like Jack Roush and I think uh, he brings a lot to this sport and, and uh, just a, a great guy. And you hate seeing him struggle. But one of the things you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, the Wood Brothers, uh, they're going to be back in the Sprint Cup Series again next season, and they have a full-time driver for next year. Yeah, and they, made it, they were aligned with Jack Rash when they had Trevor Bain as their driver. And then last, before this season, they hired Ryan Blaney in a line with Team Penske, and the performance really took off for that team. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that they've been working hard to get Ryan Blaney a full-time ride in the Sprint Cup Series. Ryan Blaney's a great young driver. Obviously, the son of Dave Blaney. He's got a good head on his shoulders. Dave Blaney was a tremendous guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryan's not that far behind him. And he came in with, with a few years ago with Tommy Baldwin, made an impression, signed that with Roger Penske, and then here he is now at the Spring Cup level, and he's had some success. I think he could win a race next year. To me, the problem is, and the reason why he went full-time Spring Cup racing, in my opinion, was that this year, this 21 car at times blew some engines, had some mechanical failures, and I think, and this is my own personal opinion, that Ryan Blaney was starting to get a little bit frustrated with the fact that this team seemed like an experimental team and not necessarily a team that was going out there and competing for wins. And so now that they're going to run full-time next year, they're about obviously going to want to make the chase, and if they win a race, they're in the chase no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ryan Blaney's run really strong at the plate tracks. I, I so agree. I think that helps Ryan Blaney significantly. I'm interested to see what kind of sponsorship comes from it. I think Ford may step up their program a little bit, Ford Motorcraft. But to me, uh, some, a lot of that sponsorship is going to come from Roger Penske. And the number one bet on this list is whether or not NASCAR is going to do the franchising. They're still not officially official on whether or not they're going to do that. And if they don't, that'll benefit the Wood Brothers greatly. But if they do, the Wood Brothers are going to need to buy a medallion in order to get themselves into the, into the field. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be interesting to see how much money they spend on that and where that comes from. If they don't, they'll be able to make it on time. But if mm-hmm. they scale back to 40 cars and do what Bob Pockris uh, wrote, wrote about a few months ago with the franchising, it might be tough for the Wood Brothers to make some of those races. Right. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you're right. There's a lot of what ifs. And that was my next question to you. Yeah, you, you're, you're too darn good. You know, uh, you, you can seem to read my mind. And uh, some of the storylines that uh, we've seen through 2015, now we're into the off season. We got the awards ceremony coming up in Las Vegas. And then we have, you know, the test and tunes and speed weeks and all that stuff coming up in February and so forth. What are some of the big storylines that we could look forward to? I know we got the rookie of the year that's going to happen uh, net next season. And I would almost think that Chase Elliott, unless he falls off the face of the earth, he's probably going to win that. Uh, but there's a lot of storylines going into the off season and for 2016. Well, you still want to know who's going to drive the nine car. That's still up in the air about Richard Petty Motorsports. Mm-hmm. It's been highly speculated that that ride is going to be David Reagan's. He's been the number one candidate for a long time. Ford seems to really like him. But recently we've been just been reading like in the 12th hour, here, Brian Scott, who's a driver for, for Richard Childress Racing, the Xfinity Series, has the Shore Lodge sponsorship with him, has emerged as a candidate for that car. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see who they hire. Some of the crew chief changes we've seen already today, Danica Patrick obviously getting Billy Scott from Michael Walter Racing. Tony Stewart, uh, this is an interesting one. He gets Mike, he might, you know, probably be announced tomorrow. Mike Bugerwitz, who was a um, engineer for the number four car, mm-hmm. um, it looks like he's going to be uh, coming over. Bugerich is going to come over and replace um, the crew chief, Chad Johnston, for the 14 of Tony Stewart. Chad Johnston going on to the 42 car. Uh, he's going to replace Chris Heroy there uh, at the 42. And also Brian Patty is going to take over for Greg Biffle next season in the 16 car. He's coming over. Another one coming over from Michael Walter Bracing. And as well as Randall Burdett will now replace Brian Burns, the 47 at A.J. Allmendinger as well. So a lot of crew chief shuffling. You mentioned the Rookie of the Year. Some of the highlighted big-time Rookie of the Year classes that I am aware of, 1979, obviously, Dale Earnhardt, and Terry Labonte, and Kyle Petty. That was a big rookie class. 1993, Jeff Gordon, Bobby Labonte, Kenny Wallace. That was another very good rookie class. Next year with Chase Elliott and then Ryan Bellamy. That could be one that rivals those two years in Rookie of the Year candidacy because I think those two are the two next stars of this sport, and the fact that both are going to be competing 
for Rookie of the Year next year will be very interesting to see who wins it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And, you know, NASCAR did a little bit of changes to the schedule. Nothing really major. I know that Bristol followed the Michigan uh, race in August, but they flip-flopped them. And, uh, you know, uh, they got the 2016 package, which we've seen uh, a couple times, Darlington, Michigan, Kentucky, and May, I think it was Indianapolis. So we, we're going to see that full-time. Um, do, do you see anything else? You know, I know silly season, we, we can only predict and, and kind of throw out there what we think is going to happen. Um, do you see any more major changes coming NASCAR's way? I know that Daytona, uh, they call it Daytona Rising. You know, they, they took down a whole bunch of uh, seats and put new ones up, and they're trying to make uh, make it a more uh, fan-friendly uh, type uh, racetrack. Uh, but do you think by building seats that they will come, kind of like Field of Dreams, or do they need to get back to their roots and kind of get back to what the fans, when they came out in droves before, to bring them back to the tracks because they're, they're struggling attendance-wise? Uh, I think they need to go back to their roots, I don't, but that's not going to happen. Right. I, I, obviously, it's who owns these racetracks. I think you know, any, people, can try, people have tried to spin it 900 different ways about why they don't go to certain venues. Um, but to me, it's obvious that, you know, whoever, ISC and SMI have the big piece of the pie, and they're not willing to give up any pieces of those pie, of that pie to any of the other small, maybe independent track owners. Um, and so as long as that's the case, no dates are going to get moved. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to, you know, you're not going to see many schedule changes. And to me, I think you should go back to your roots. The Martinsvilles, the Darlingtons that we, that we have on this schedule, those aren't big cities, but those towns are known because of the racing. And I think we need to get back to towns like that. Mm-hmm. I'll throw a couple more towns in there. I, I actually interned with a girl at my job who told this kid where she was from, and he had no idea where she was from. And when she said the words Rockingham, North Carolina, <laughs> my eyes turned lit up, and I said, I know Rockingham. Right. The only reason why I knew Rockingham, North Carolina, was because of the racetrack that's there in Rockingham. Mm-hmm. Because... Yeah. We didn't need a big city to sell our sport. We just needed good racing. Right. And with the TV the way it is, and listen, TV's going to change in the next 20 years. You're already starting to see bits and pieces of it. You can't buy a TV now that doesn't hook the Internet. It's called a smart TV. Mm-hmm. That's the future. You're gonna, your TV is going to – you saw the NFL game on Yahoo this year. That's the future where you're going to be able to see a much more accurate rating. People are going to download what they want when they want to watch it on television. And if when that happens – that's going to be huge for NASCAR because you're not going to be able to rely on the same old rating system, and you're going to need you're going to get a much more accurate rating. TV is going to be the way it's going to go. Mm-hmm. TV is the future. People don't want to drive all the way to the racetrack anymore. You see attendance in football, baseball, basketball dwindling because people just don't want to go anymore. They want to watch it in front of their television sets. And as mm-hmm. TV gets better and better and better, you can pause, rewind, get up, go to the bathroom, drink as much beer as you want. You want to make the product as best as possibly can be on television. Right. Because that's where the money is. And go into a track where the racing may not be as good, but you have more seats and you have casinos there, I don't think is a very smart business move. But that's what they're doing because they own those racetracks. And for now, in the next four or five years, those tracks are going to make money. But when things start to change, I think you're going to see things taper off. And, you know, that's the excuse of why they got out of North Wilkesboro, why they got out of Rockingham was, oh, we don't have enough seats. Well, right. now you're tearing down seats, so that excuse is idiotic. Right. It doesn't matter where the races run. It doesn't matter if it's in Rockingham or in Darlington or in Martinsville. It doesn't matter where it's ran. TV is going to be the number one big thing for this team and for this sport. And if the racing is good, it will sell itself on television. And that's the most important thing, not where it's ran and not how many seats are at a racetrack. I, just, I see it coming, and I'm only I'm 26 years old. I may not be as smart the smartest individual alive, but if I see it coming, you have to understand, I don't understand how NASCAR Mm -hmm. doesn't see that coming, and I just don't see how this current model will benefit them in the future, going to big racetracks with a lot of seats that are empty. Well, I remember back in the days, you know, ESPN and TNN racing and the stuff when that was just, the, it was the hardcore racing and it was really raw type television. Now you had NBC with 
the race coverage, and you had NBCSN that had what they th- this called this hot pass thing, where you were able to watch the four champions going or the, the guys going for the championship, and you kind of flick back and forth, and you can kind of hear, you know, like you said, this is the evolution of television and, and the coverage that they have. You know, before it was just, hey, I'm these, I'm I'm going to tell you how the race is going. You're going to watch it, and it's going to be in kind of a, a, a you know, a really uh, snowy type, you know, looking uh, camera view and so forth. And now you've got this hot pass thing. Which, to be honest with you, I've been to races before, just like you. And next television basically is that's what that hot pass was. I wasn't very impressed by it because they still censor everything before it can get to your ears over the television. And that stinks. I mean, I'm sorry. I know. I understand the legitimacy. I, I know why NASCAR does it. Mm-hmm. You're going to get the three or four people that are going to race race hell about the language that these drivers use. But listen, there's worse things your kid could be exposed to. I want to see, listen, if my driver was out there, Rusty Wallace, growing up, I want him to curse. I want him to get angry. I want him mm-hmm. to throw things. I want him to freak out. I want my driver to be passionate because I'm passionate. Right. And I think you lose some of that with the censoring that they do. Uh, it, and, you, and a lot of times you miss what else they're saying because they're doing such a bad job at censoring it. You get the curse word, mm-hmm. but then you don't get whatever else they say after it. <laughs> and that's the interesting part. Right. And so... You sit there and you go, what's the point? I heard him drop the F-bomb, but I didn't hear anything else after it. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, Very well said. You're right. You know, when you go to the track, you can hear, you know, everybody's like, oh, Dale Jr., you know, he's got himself quite a mouth. They all do because they're competitive. And I miss that because that's the edgy stuff that, you know, you want to hear. You want want to hear the passion. And it doesn't matter if it's a bad word, good word, or indifferent. You want to hear what they have to say uncensored. And, again, I, I didn't really like that. Last question I have for you. Is Jeff Gordon on the way out, all the pomp and circumstances that you saw throughout the year and then culminating at Homestead. Do you think we still see uh, the same pomp and circumstances next year when Tony Stewart exits uh, full-time racing? Yeah, I think we do. Um, it's almost like when some, and I hate to use this analogy, but I think it's a good one. It's almost like when somebody dies. Mm-hmm. No matter what they've done throughout their lifetime, they're going to speak good about them. And, and so when Tony Stewart, we know all the stuff he's done in the past that has angered fans, angered people, all of a sudden yesterday, you know, all these people who I didn't know knew stock car racing, if I knew they watched stock car racing, used to lambaste and hate on Jeff Gordon. All of a sudden yesterday, they're the biggest Jeff Gordon fans alive. <laughs> I think you're going to see that again next year with Tony Stewart. Right. When really, you know, I, I didn't post much about Jeff Gordon because, yeah, it's a nice, it's, it was sad to see him go, but he wasn't my favorite driver. I'm not going right. to sit here and try and lie to people and tell you he was my favorite driver. I couldn't stand him in the 90s. I didn't like Tony Stewart early on. I've grown a lot of res- much more respect for Tony Stewart over the years, um, because he was a driver who spoke his mind and somebody who didn't really care what NASCAR had to think, thought about what he had to say. Um, the, the classic line when they reconfigured uh, Las Vegas and he was running an Xfinity Series race there, and he was in the back of a pickup truck and slammed Chris Powell, the track director. I mean, that was hysterical and classic. And you just don't see that kind of stuff anymore. <laughs> right. But I like that kind of stuff. Most fans don't. Most fans want them to be vanilla. And so even though they don't like Tony Stewart and a lot of fans hate Tony Stewart, you're going to see the outpouring of love and respect for Tony Stewart that you saw for Jeff Gordon yesterday. And you'd see that for Donald Trump if he was driving a race car, and you'd see that for (laughs) numerous other people if they were driving race cars. Because that would be the neat thing to do at the time. Yeah, I <laughs> very well said. I, I completely agree with you. And Brandon, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that there's going to be plenty to talk about in the off season, and uh, this will not be the last time we hear from you between now and Speed Weeks. But uh, all I can say is uh, your knowledge is plentiful. Uh, love having you on the show. Uh, Talking in Circles podcast is a great show. I've been part of it a couple times. I listen in all the time, and your knowledge is vastful. And uh, I can tell you, the listeners really do appreciate you. Jumping on board, County Line Sports, and uh, I hope that you, uh, your family, and friends, and everybody have the very best and safe, happy uh, Thanksgiving. And you too, Bill. And you know, family is the most important thing around these times. Spend the time with your family because the schedule is long. It's a 30, 38 race week schedule, and you should be in front of your TV watching every Sunday um, and watching all the races. And your excuse is, "Well, I spent plenty of time with you guys during the off season." So right. do that, and I uh, have a, you know you have a great. Turkey Day, and all the listeners out there have a great tur- have safe Turkey Day. And the night before Thanksgiving, please be safe because uh, that's the most important night for sure is to be safe when you're doing that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And uh, can you tell the listeners uh, when is the uh, Talking in Circles podcast going to be available to listen to this week? 
I think we're going to do, going to do it tomorrow night, right around maybe 10 or 11 o'clock. We haven't yeah. really decided on the time yet. Um, so tomorrow night, it'll be posted on our on Twitter, on our Twitter feed, on our Facebook page as well. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We're going to do the best we can to keep up with all the off-season changes and off-season moves. The silly season, uh, you know, we'll share and retweet what we've seen. Mm-hmm. There's been so much going on today with all the crew chief changes, um, and we've tried to keep up with you guys as best as possible. I know it makes your head hurt, but, you know, <laughs> you follow us on that as well, and we'll try to explain it. And if you have any questions, of course, just ask, and we'll try and get them to deliver the best as possible. Absolutely, Brandon. Again, thank you so much for uh, uh, this season. I know that uh, I think we've only been on maybe about six, seven weeks, but I tell you, it's been very uh, interesting. I learn an awful lot every time I talk to you, and the fans absolutely love having you on board. And again, we'll talk to you during the off season. Happy Thanksgiving, and I uh, appreciate everything you do for County Line Sports. And thanks, Bill. I can't wait for the off season and uh, going to this through next year with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you. All right, that was Brandon Caldwell. He is one of the hosts for Talking in Circles podcast. Check it out. You don't want to miss it. He's on Facebook. He's on Twitter. Great guy. So much knowledge. Enjoy talking to him. Uh, Wish NASCAR started next week because uh, very, very insightful and uh, good to listen to. And uh, we do appreciate everything he does for County Line Sports. We'll be right back with more of County Line Sports right after this.